Right. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, my name is Suren. I'll be co-presenting with uh, Saurav from um, Google Infrastructure Kernel uh, team, and we'll be presenting. We'll talk about uh, allocation pro uh, memory profiling, the current status, some results from the deployment, and uh, also some of the next steps that we are planning to do. Um, let's see. So just a quick overview, memory allocation profiling. Uh, in essence, basically, it's, a, uh, it's an option that we can enable in kernel, config option. Uh, when enabled, uh, it exposes uh, proc alloc info, proc fs file, where, which contains um, locations where allocations are made in kernel, uh, total size of uh, allocation made at that location, and total number of allocations. So basically, it's provides information about uh, all the kernel allocations uh, along with some additional information. Uh, so the feature is developed so that it has very low overhead and intended with intentions that it's deployed in, the, in production. Um, and the, stat the current status is that it's uh, merged in 6.10 kernel. Um, and we are planning to deploy it in Android kernel starting next release, in, which will be cut from 6.12, most likely. And uh, it's also, we are also having um, deployed it in uh, uh, Google Infrastructure kernel as a pilot program, and which involves over 1,000 uh, servers. So we will, uh, next we'll present some results, results from, that, uh, from that deployment. And Saurav will present that. Thank you, Sorin. All right, so I'll talk about the deployment of memory allocation profiling. With the goal of reducing wasteful memory overheads, we ran a pilot program consisting of standalone testbed machines and even 1,250 production machines. From there, we gathered the alloc info and we um, uh, stored it in a centralized DB in an automated manner. And then we built dashboards for visualization and tracking, as you see on the right-hand side plot. Each and every line corresponds to a different allocation call site, and we have grouped these allocations based on the subsystem, such as memory management, networking, and so on. Now, while this dashboard corresponds to a single machine, we also have the capability to get the data for, from all the machines, um, providing visibility across 0.4 petabytes of data at any given time. From this, we have identified the heaviest allocation call sites and even those allocation call sites which vary a lot across time. The plot on the right-hand side is a good example of that. So this is the Rx buffer allocations made by a specific network driver, and we have plotted the worst two machines. If you look at the purple machine, first of all, you'll see a zigzag-like pattern, and at times, the allocation size is excess of 120 GBs. So once we see something like this, the question arises, can it be reduced or could it be charged correctly? And if not, does it correlate to any SLO violations such as packet latency or packet drops? Now I want to go over one success story where memory allocation profiling was the enabler. And this comes from the cloud machines. So from a standalone testbed machine, we gathered the alloc info and we stack ranked the allocations. The plot on the right hand side shows the um, allocation size on the y axis and the stack rank on the x axis. Each and every dot corresponds to a different allocation call site. And once we had this, we sent this report to the domain experts, the curated reduction plans. And through simple configuration changes, we could eliminate the allocations represented by the orange crosses. Now, this has led to about 7 GBs of saving per machine, um, which um, for that specific VM family. And we're aiming for further 2 GB savings per machine. Now, all of this means that there are fewer kernel overheads, leading to more memory available for guest VMs. Now, throughout this process, I want to specify the needs identified. Now, because of using page extension, um, the memory overhead of using this feature is about 2 GB per machine, or roughly 0.3% uh, of the machine capacity. And also, we observed that the pilot machine spent um, 41% more time in alloc pages node mask because of looking up the page extension. 
And another pain point that we um, felt was the lack of context. For example, on some machine we saw that XAS alloc resulted in 1.5 GBs of allocations, but we couldn't tell where it's coming from. Is it coming from Shemim add to page cache or some other function? So a generalized mechanism to get the entire call stack or the context would be useful. And so Suren will speak about how we plan to um, tackle these problems. All right, that gets us into the future planning. So basically what we are uh, working on and what we are planning to work on next. Uh, the first thing is to um, address those needs that were identified. Uh, which is basically the overhead. Uh, I recently posted a patch set to uh, store the page allocation tag references in the page flags, if there are enough uh, bits in the page flags which are available. Uh, so the feedback was that configuration is nightmare. We need a simpler way to, to configure it. So I modified the patch set to have just one config option, yes or no option, basically, uh, to say if it's enabled, then we will try to uh, stores the references in the page flags, and uh, if we are successful, we use that. If not, we will fall back back to the page extensions. Uh, so that's going to be done auto basically automatically by system, and the user will get a warning that hey, we are not able to do what you asked for, but so we are falling back, and you have an option to disable this config. Um, other than that, we are working on a couple of new features. One is um, I, using the GFP flags to identify accounted versus unaccounted uh, allocations. Uh, another one is um, collecting information about average uh, lifespan of an allocation. So for every tag, we'll have uh, the average, you know, how, how long does this allocation actually exist uh, in the system. That, that information can be lately, later used to categorize different allocations and maybe group them. Um, so uh, there are some, um, there might be some uh, optimization techniques that we can use. Um, so I'm also planning to bring back the, not bring back, uh, the context capture, which was mentioned just now. Uh, it's a feature that was included in the original RFC, but then we removed it to simplify the patch set, the first version of patch set. So I'm working on bringing you know, that back and uh, introducing it. And uh, finally, we are also working on some um, user space tooling to simplify the data uh, collection and analysis. And once we are satisfied with, with the state of those tools, we will uh, start upstreaming those as well. So I think that's, yeah, that's the last um, slide in the presentation, and I'll open it for questions, comments, it, feedback. A bit unrelated question to Surav. Uh, are the dashboard processing and everything is open source? Uh, no, that's only internal. It's good, yeah. Uh, can you remind me what, what what, what is the context capturing? What exactly? So context capturing, basically, um, it's a second, kind of a second stage. So let's say you uh, capture the data, you have your alloc info that at this location, this much memory is allocated. Um, you see that it's growing. You don't know who is using it. So you can specify, okay, for this particular allocation, I want to capture context. So context will be the so call, call stacks, uh, timestamps, some additional information that will help you to track down who is actually abusing your system, who is allocating basically and uh, maybe not freeing. Okay, so right. Yes, and, and that means you will you will be able to capture the call stack, and you will not need to wrap any common helpers into the macros to make them distinguish their callers anymore. Because that was the main thing we were afraid of. Like for every cold side that you cannot distinguish, you have to wrap it. And that, that's a maintenance overhead. So with this context capture, this won't be necessary. So the, no, the context capture is optional because it has additional overhead, right? We, we cannot capture context for every single allocation. That's why it's built as a two-stage thing. First, you are you, you get very cheap uh, way, um, you know, with a very low overhead, you are getting uh, high level uh, information about allocations. Once you identify it, okay, this allocations looks finicky, 
I want to look in deeper, you, spe uh, you enable context capture specifically for that allocation. So everything else doesn't change. Everything else is still you know, uh, fast. But for that allocation, when it happens, we basically spend a, a bit more time to capture the context, get the timestamps, store all that data, and so on. So in a sense, it's, um, it's built so that it's uh, performant, but when you, have, when you need more data, you can uh, enable the capturing specifically for the location you are interested in. Uh, enabling it everywhere would be, would not be deployable. It, it, it occurs to me that that context capture is, sounds identical to what you can get with, um, with the BPF trace with the K-Stack. And so I wonder if, if you, you might want to go with uh, making your context capture just uh, enabling or, or at least creating a trace point for all of those locations. And then it's just a no op sled until you, until you need it. And then you use an existing extremely full featured system to explore the context instead of, instead of building your own small duplicate of that corner of BPF trace. Um, maybe that would, mm, that would require a trace point for every allocation. Well, well, actually I guess. trace point is a bit overkill. Um, I mean, all you really need is a K probe, which might already be there. In other words, if it's a function and it's not mm -hmm. static, it probably has K probe will be there at the lowest level, no prof allocation, right? But then up the call chain, you you want the hook for K probe will be in the alloc pages, no prof, uh, and you'll need the filter somehow filter the context that get into the, the point of uh, K probe itself. It the the. the the entry for K probe will be down the, the call stack, and uh, at the allocation you want to context, maybe it's too late. Like, I mean, that's okay uh, to the extent that the rest of the call stack has non-static functions. Um, you you can see the call you can see the call stack already, and this is what I'm talking about with. BPF trace already having done the work for you, so you don't have to go through and, 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 and write this. I, I, I speak with some experience of, of exploring running systems with BPF trace and finding out when when can I get the calling stack, when can I not, when can I get the return arguments, and I constantly run into this frustration of, well, if it's a static function, it usually it's not there. If it's already a trace point, you've got it. If it's a non-static function, you usually can see it. But all that stuff is there, and that's why I'm, I'm eager to see if we can just use it. Would you consider installing all the BPF programs and everything that you need in the production? Well, you don't have to install BPF in order to get BPF trace. It's really just a more sophisticated version of F trace in, in some ways. Uh, right, but um, will, will you have everything that you need to enable that capturing in the, in the production machine? I, I mean, generally, yeah. I, I've, in my experience, when I somebody gives me this thing and says, here, you know, fix it. It's running and it, it's going to reproduce something ugly. Uh, yeah. Okay, so it's not not it's, usually it's, used only in, on debug, in the debugging environment. Yeah. It, it, should be, it should be available. Okay, that, that might be an option, so let's, let's talk about it. All right. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.